Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We have a wonderful show today, a reading from Lady of Light by Diane Wachowski by Shinga Press 2018. Diane Wachowski was born in Whittier, California in 1937. She graduated from UC Berkeley with a BA in 1960. She was the poet in residence at Michigan State University from 1975 until she retired. I fell in love with Diane Wachowski's poetry in 1966 when I bought and read her Discrepancies and Apparitions, Doubleday, 1966. Diane has strength of line and excellent use of extended metaphor. Her images are gem-like. Her work combines the personal and the mythic Robinson Jeffers, The Long Poem, and William Carlos Williams, No Ideas But in Things, are two of her influences. Wachowski has had 24 books of poetry published, including Emerald Ice, which won the William Carlos Williams Award in 1989. Wachowski wrote, quote, American poetry is always about defining oneself individually, claiming one's right to be different and often break taboos. Distinctly, American poetry is usually written in the context of one's geographic landscape, sometimes out of one's cultural myths, and often with reference to gender and race or ethnic origins. American poets celebrate their bodies very specifically as Whitman did. Family, identity, beauty, relationships with men are some of the themes in Lady of Light. Diane Wachowski is a luminous, sensuous American poet, one of the best of the whole epic. The magnificent readers are Corinne Conley, Kay Wiseman, Helen Richmond, Tony Sawyer, so here's Kay Wiseman. This is Harlequin Rose. Four of us went there one August evening, driving up to a battered and rambling colonial house converted into a beach resort town bar with a dance floor. And a Saturday night crowd beginning to line up. Bouncers looking like Tom Cruise and Clint Eastwood smiling at Texas yellow roses in blue jeans, silk blouses, and strappy shoes, their dates in cowboy hats. And when we enter the Long Island cocktail of rich and working, a table full of poets who publish little magazines, laughing with painters who only show in local galleries, fishermen, students, and carpenters, even newspaper editors and firemen out on a Saturday night. We entered this night of the Harlequin Rose. It's hard to explain how going to a bar called the Wild Rose was simultaneously like being in a family album and a Harlequin paperback, romancing the stone, the one with a woman on the cover holding an emerald big as a glass of bourbon, her bodice torn, and Jesse, played by Michael Douglas in shadow, wearing his striped crocodile boots. None of us could have been Kathleen Turner playing the love-starved novelist. And I'm not saying that it was really like a family reunion either. My aunts are all buried and dead with aquamarine brooches, rhinestone earrings, and smooth bosoms uncles in their umbrellas and suits. The red as radishes, old fashioned, almost wild roses on a summer bush are profuse and scatter their petals on the ground. No one picks these chubby roses for a vase as they don't last, are clustered on short stems, all petal and quickly shedding. Nothing like the shapely deep budded teenage American beauty rose. They are like old aunts whom you know once were young women, though from pictures you don't really see their youth as looking anything like your own. 
These anti-roses are the essence of themselves. As my aunts were quintessential women, I hardly noticed them with their big breasts and sparkling earrings. They flourished bright red, dropped their petals, and seemed only a part of someone. My friend Constance, like a hybrid tea, is middle-aged and married, but longing for another man. She searches every face to see if the briar dreamer might be there, he who offers her a rose hip of temptation, which so far she has not tasted. She is an unusual combination, like the climbing peace rose, and he is, what is he? To her, I think, a bramble, a prickly hedge. And me, I am older and happily married, and not like any rose except perhaps an actual wild rose, one that hardly looks like the roses, which are called English, Grandiflora, Damask, and Tea. I, even when I was young, was a mallow, or the small Fru Dagmar Hastrup da Rosa. The other two women with us, a mother and her daughter, are strangers to me. The daughter is like another rose, this one lilac-hued, cultivated, very delicate and tight. Perhaps the hothouse favorite, Catherine Mimay, or the Burbank, whose bright rose-pink double flowers lighten as they mature. Her chunky European mother is a meteor, streaking through the sky, or a bit of an asteroid caught on fire as it enters the Earth's atmosphere, transcending Earth, making fireworks of crimson in the sky. The pink rose is also married, young, but acting old. This should be her night out from the children, but she is actually longing for her husband who is home babysitting and making home improvements. Everybody's life is a soap opera for he has recently recovered from a brain tumor. And you can see she finds it hard to leave him alone for evening and evening now that he's recovered. Her mother, the fiery remnant of a Perside meteor shower is my age, but looks older. When the pyrotechnics die, she becomes a cosmos, a hollyhock, a zinnia, some everyday hardy flower, or perhaps like the Gallicas, the oldest of all garden roses who date back more than 3,000 years and can thrive in poor soil. She too could be seen in the context of rose beauty tonight, Rosa Munde. She is not thinking of the retired art dealer husband whom she loves, who is happily at home watching Rosen Cavalier on video. She's immersed in the dancers, the wild rose dance hall, the evening spectacle, her whole body moving in her seat. She is full into its immediate joy and a tall cowboy, probably a fisherman or local expression, asks her to dance saying, I watched you moving in your seat from across the room. She leaps up. For the first time, she joins our species. Like the apothecary's Rose of Provence brought to France and England by the Crusaders from Damascus, or one of those country roses in my summer bush, her face is loosely petaled, open, full of excitement. She dances and ring around the rosy abandon, the cowboy floppy limb too, both of them blooming fast. I envy her lack of inhibition, her perfect confidence in an overweight body and old lady hair. Myself, I watch still as a ceramic flower, afraid even to move my face, afraid to display even my thoughts, to say nothing of feelings. 
afraid of anything that would shatter my porcelain déjà vu. I am trying to be invisible until I realize that I don't need to try. I am invisible because I am old. No man is looking at me, thinking of my mysteries or secrets, wondering if he dare approach. I am my aunts now, chubby roses like the Hansa of Netherlands, though choosing pearls rather than sparkles with the flat bosom of my generation, an icon against female age. Despite that, there is no longer even a king of Spain watching me invisible in his golden shoes with Spanish eyes as he did in the past. Something has happened. Perhaps my aunts are watching me now from their graves or my mother from her Neptune society cremated ashes thrown out to sea. No, not even that. No one is watching me now. I am entirely invisible. It's hard to explain why going to a dark bar can be a barge on the Nile or why a wild rose dance hall can be so filled with radish light or why the fact that it is called the wild rose makes it seem like la vie en rose or why this summer's wild rose bush of spent petals seems to give off whips of that summer night when I pass it or if it might be the flapping Harlequin cover on the paperback romance, whose last chapter I have just finished writing, slash living. I myself, not a sepal displaced, watch all the different segments of the local population, enjoy my glass of actually rather good Van Rosé. I am motionless but imagining the rhythms, the shoulders, the hips, and the feet of all dancers released from any sense that I began with, any impulse that I might want to join them on the floor. Not even a fantasy left in my 60-year-old body, my mouth only a thin crescent of the moon's wild rose night smile. Instead, I am thinking already of autumn, imagining that the oak leaves at the end of my backyard in Michigan have turned to the gold light of a woman who is my son. Sleeping alone in the afternoon on a bed with the fallen petals, already in the bower of my aunts, though long away from their rose rouge dead lips, my friend Constance is dancing now, and it seems so in rhythm with the evening that I, the revenant, wish I could conjure up the briar man for her, give him a life connected to hers, make him appear through the door into the wild rose, walk onto the dance floor, come up behind Constance and slip his arms around her, a happy ending instead of a long, tired drive home to the other end of the island. Four women alone came to the wild rose one summer night to make that effort, to imagine ourselves tight-butted once more, longing for the Marriott frenzy, dancing in a group with shoes abandoned, why are we not surprised to find the Dionysian opposite as we scatter for the night? Because all the dancers are just like us, like Aunt Eva, Aunt Ella. Because we are overblown roses now, aunties reading as my mother did in the nursing home, the paperback romances we once all wrote our lives into. Four women alone that night, dropping crimson petals.
at the Harry Northrup Cafe. A poem letter. So I am drinking the last sip of Spanish Pinot Noir in my glass and reading the interview with you, Harry, published in the penultimate issue of Chiron, a poetry tabloid. Sad that the horse-legged smart publication must close its barn doors. Your responses, my Hollywood actor and poet friend, tasted like good java in a New Jersey diner and made me realize our paths could have crossed in New York City many years before we met in L.A. You speak of practicing a scene at Leland Hickman's Greenwich Village apartment, 1966. Let's see, what was I doing then? 66 was the year of my first Doubleday book discrepancies and apparitions. Looking at the cover jacket, I see myself slim-armed, long hair, coiled up loosely and fastened with tortoise cell hairpins. My smile a little bit of jack-o'-lantern in window. If I had a snap of you, it would probably show you with a lean Adlai Stevenson face Sincerity in the thrust of your shoulders. You speak of a journey, and I think of our quests to discover most worthy chivalric selves. For you, it's directors, Martin Scorsese, Jonathan Demi. For me, it's been editors, particularly one editor, John Martin, of Black Sparrow Press. He's the man who made Charles Bukowski the most well-known poet of L.A. You know the reason that poetry is not a popular art? Even though there are exceptions, the Bulowskis who magnetically attract underachievers, and the Billy Collins who sing a siren song to middle-aged, well-educated academics, is that poetry is subtle, always a bit perverse, and never without a little piece of broken glass you are asked to swallow. Academia only disguises this. You speak of just discovering poetry then because two plays and a film fell through. Though I didn't know you, you were living not far from me on 25th Street at 10th Avenue. You say that poetry seemed like a way to use all this emotion inside of me that needed to come out. Yes, as if we are the cherry blossoms that scatter every spring, or feathers that all gulls leave on California beaches. In those days, I went every week, both to the open mic readings and the scheduled poetry readings that had moved via the wonderful, not nearly enough recognized poet and poetry entrepreneur, Paul Blackburn. From first the 10th Street Coffee House to Les Deux Mégots, Le Metro, and finally to St. Mark's Poetry Project, which was funded later in the 60s by the NEA. Paul helped many young poets find their voices before he himself died of cancer, way too young and in upstate New York. You quote him well, make your point. Don't go on for sound, don't mark time. Cut back and write a poem about an intersection in a city as about a tree. Had either of us yet heard of the Frank O'Hara, I do this, I do that poem? <laughs> you found a way to invent your own version. That's always been a very important point for me. You say in your interview to write in the external world. I myself never did anything worth reporting and have worshipped William's manifesto, no ideas, but in things, 
Harry. I envy you having so many things, including a sport in your past, baseball, the American game. I have never had a game, thus my fascination for gambling. You mentioned that when you were 14, you started acting and began winning speech contests. That's another history we share. High school forensics. When you graduated and joined the Navy, you went to San Diego for boot camp. My own father was a Navy career man, an enlisted man, with the oxymoronic title Chief Petty Officer. <laughs> I remember as a little girl during World War II begging to go with my mother when, after his leaves, she drove him back to the aircraft carrier, either when they were stationed in San Diego or San Pedro. Those early morning drives, with my mother often still in her bathrobe, gave, give me the smoking images of pumping oil wells and dew-stoked orange groves, and the sense of closeness my father always brought. It would be gone when he was. Well, Harry, you speak of being from Nebraska, but you, of course, are the quintessential, perhaps the only Hollywood poet. I myself am from Southern California. I tell people I am a California poet, though the favorite place I've ever lived was New York City, Manhattan. But I am never anthologized as either a California poet or a New York poet. Such is the stigma of the Midwest where I have lived for 40 years. Lou Welch wrote about it well in his poem, Chicago. It snuffles on the beach of its great lake like a blind red rhinoceros. It's already running us down. And your teacher, Anne Stanford, went to my high school about a decade before I did. She and I are both on the FUHS Wall of Fame, along with Richard Nixon. You mentioned the L.A. poetry scene, beginning with magazines like Coastlines and California Quarterly. Guess what? My first published adult poem was in Coastlines. Good story about that, too. I was an undergraduate at Berkeley and beginning to submit my poems to mags. I sent some to Coastlines, but never heard from them, or so I thought. One day, I was browsing at the UC Corner bookstore, and in a just-arrived copy of Coastlines, there was my poem. The author's bio page said, We couldn't reach Diane Wachowski, but have published the poem she submitted. You know why they couldn't reach me? I didn't know until then, but I investigated. I was living in an apartment with a friend, Joan Mar Morton, who had stolen my boyfriend, Bob Chrisman, and between them, they decided that I was a witch. And to punish me, took my mail and threw it away. This must have been around 1958. So here I am, half a century later in the Midwest, and you in Southern California, Harry brother, poet, good friend, we've traded places. You say LA represents something new and there's the sprawling quality and it's academic, anti-academic. Wow, that describes both of us, I think. You say you'd like to be remembered as a good poet and a good actor who worked in Hollywood without nepotism being the reason. Me, I wouldn't mind being remembered as a California girl. The one who said, this book is dedicated to all the men who betrayed me in hopes they will fall off their motorcycles and break their necks. <laughs> Does that sound like a Midwesterner talking? Don't you hear the Pacific Ocean still roaring in my voice? And the rasp of that little piece of glass I swallowed so long ago. While, Harry, the glass in your dedicated actor's throat has the smoothness of ocean-burnished sea glass. 
in my dream. He leaned over me like a lynx, lowering his head to sniff the sleeping breath of a human. He leaned over me as a young sunflower moves its surprised head towards the sun. He leaned over me, but as we were kissing, all I could think of was how disappointed he would be that he'd never fathom I once knew how to kiss. No longer could I do spontaneously what I once did so well. How can kisses be so surprising? Like watering an orchid and noticing a new spike with barely showing buds. I thought of how film has replaced life for me and wondered how can actors sometimes make the kiss so slow, so erotic, but somehow not carnal, like touching the petal of a fleshy blossom, say, calla lily, tuberous begonia, lavender rose, moist as skin, drop speckled from the morning shower. How absurd that even in my dream, I was not able to carpe diem. And waking, it's the angst I sustain while the sensuous petals fall away. Cinnamon Soap for Norman Hindley, who made himself sick, snorting cinnamon after someone told him it would increase his imaginative powers. <laughs> it comes in large hunks like marble, paving tar black streaks undulating through the waxy layers of tan bark from weathered tree, honeycomb perfect. I cut it into hand-sized wedges open on an indigo soap dish. Its form seems to present a sacred thunderstorm now past. Norman, when someone told you that you could get high, even improve your mind sniffing cinnamon, this is probably what he meant. A bathroom furnished by a woman with pristine surfaces, mirrors, vials, all swirled in the scent of cinnamon and clove that you too could make a shrine, polish your tiles, lay out soft towels, carve the soap. You could walk into your own bathroom as I would walk into mine each morning, a postulant. The incense of cleanliness as godliness would swing from your hands as you washed them, then your face in cinnamon. Just the way morning arrives, the lotus of every day might arrange itself suddenly, stealthily, a cinnamon mist barely seen. Each sunrise, my bathroom is still as a pond at dawn. The chunk of soap, a cinnamon lotus on new day surface, its frosty spice radiating out in rings that swirl and vanish. I know I am its acolyte. Ode to my hands. Sometimes I think my old hands are beautiful, like Arabians nuzzled into Kentucky bluegrass, their coats with the satin of chestnuts before they are roasted. My hands, though, are spotted more like giraffe skin and lying across my book as if they might be newborn awkward foals not able to be deft with small pieces, <laughs> like the backs of my pearl earring studs. Baby giraffes looking up but resting against their mother's book. My handwriting gets smaller and harder to read. These spotted translucent hands seem too plump to write a thin line. 
They do look like miniature hens, pale frogs, or shaky legged foals as they rest on pages of Wallace Stevens or on my denim knees. Still, they cleave to my body, though it hardly seems to belong to me anymore. My mind curls too, like the giraffe's lashes, fringed, petal-like, and so inappropriately as if for romance, as do my old hands. In Tai Chi, you are supposed to hold out beautiful lady wrists. And as I was circling through the form this morning, piercing into my living room windows, came a shaft of light that exactly passed into my undulating hands. A pen of light dipped into its own ink and I pulled it through the air, knowing for a moment that despite my age, I could still write this ode and perhaps even still reinvent myself with my hands that have always longed to play at Peter Quince's Calabir. If men are trees and women are flowers, that would account for why I can identify so few trees. Even when I was a child, I named blue lupine, hibiscus or hydrangea. When a flowered head would nod hello to me, I could be sure of the difference between a camellia and a gardenia, though their petals, smooth as porcelain saucers, have such a similar shape but the identity of trees remains a mystery. Even now, I cannot distinguish between sycamore and hickory. Though I was born knowing the public names of flowers, even lilacs, which I never saw in my native Southern California, there was something not privy to me at birth. Hearing a fuchsia chime out one day, I sensed magenta and purple words. I tuned into a different utterance and found that flowers had secret names. In fact, everything has a secret name, one that it can't refuse to respond to. If I call out rose, thousands might answer, but if I say beaker, only one dark pink bud will offer her fragrance or brush my hand. If I say pipette instead of syringia, then the blue flower might turn to me and open its small faces to my own differently. I learned to keep lists and notebooks as flowers whispered those names to me. Even as I bent down to pansies when I was nine, not caring for anything but their velvet faces, I sensed I should begin to listen. Where their lips that close softly over vowels that spit out consonants, trees, have never spoken to me. No wonder I do not understand or know their names. The constant momentum of leaves, the fact that unlike flowers' petals, they are never still, implies that trees are always speaking, but not to me. They are not whispering their names. They are saying, Go away, don't touch me. They are whirling and making sounds, but unlike flowers, they are not saying their names. Their names are not what I was bored with, not what I heard shushing into my ears as a baby. Men 
whose branching leaves are always dependably rushing, always shaking heads, always saying no, yet never moving out of their frames, are foreshadowing their future departure from me. And flowers, flowers are still, they remain. Oh, syringia pipette, woody branch nymphette, beaker my own, I know you will never leave. This is what I say back to flowers after they have divulged their names. Spending autumn mornings with Daniel Bearboin. In the autumn of 2016, I began a morning discipline listening to and watching a DVD of Daniel Berenboim performing all 32 of Beethoven's sonatas while writing a daily poem or meditation. I combined this exercise in hearing and seeing with my morning's bathing, grooming, dressing, while mentally and physically preparing for each day. It was not new for me to play DVDs of ballet, opera, or pa piano recitals during my morning's ablutions, but it was different for me to make a discipline of it. It is also the first time in my life that I have ever, ever written poetry while listening to music. I had always spurned the practice as diluting the way I would think. When we are young, do we know how to grieve? The eternal youth of Daniel Berenboim, as I observe him playing the Tempest again, takes both a feeling of empathy, as if I too were a young pianist pounding out this magnificent piece. But it also makes me crave a DVD with a mature Daniel B performing. I think for him, aging is not a bad thing. I must look up his dates, but I think of him as my contemporary. So probably in his late seventies now, I hope he will never have to stop performing as Rubenstein never did. At 90, Rubenstein traveled to Russia to meet members of his extended family still living there. His performances as he toured, he had memorized everything and played it all. Beethoven, Mozart, Chopin, Rachmaninoff were in part recorded on DVD. They are energetic, sparkling alive and powerful with his virtuosity. He himself was gentle, gracious with his relatives and fans as well. Very inspiring. I think the section of the second movement of the Tempest equals the calm one feels over having cried in grief over a great loss for several hours the clearing, perhaps, seeing glimpses of revelation, usually ways of obliterating the source of the grief. Your sister has died, and you will never again talk to a person who knew you when you were little and wore black high top shoes. Or the man you love more than you ever thought possible has left you and married someone else. Or the horse you raised 
from a foal and on which you have ridden to so many ribbons and cups has had to be put down. Grief, does it accompany every loss? I once thought so, but realize now that I didn't know how to grieve when I was a child. And that in periods such as war, when loss dominates not only your life, but that of the community, also in serious illness, hurricane, unjust politics, overt racial discrimination, big force of nature events. Then the grieving seems self-indulgent, inappropriate, almost extravagant. Your energies should be engaged in community effort to solve the problem. Oh yes, the third movement of the Tempest is teasing me with its melodic theme. I did not realize love for my sister when she was alive, as perhaps I do now. Major minor keys. I think most people, normal people, live their lives in a major key for me. This is the equivalent of living in the present. A romantic lives always in the future with fantasies of shapely dramas. The melancholic lives in the past, either passionately resuffering its tragedies or nostalgically immured in luminous images of what is lost and irretrievable. The minor keys, of course, are romantic or melancholy every day. I have never been able to live in the present. It is my failing and defect. Thirty-three for Robert Turney. Why thirty-three parts in this suite of poems, you asked? That was what I originally planned. Because Beethoven wrote 32 sonatas in his lifetime. 33 is a prime number, you replied. Therefore, you must write a 33 third poem. So even though 33 is not a prime number, and this is not actually the 33rd poem, I will write this for you, Robert, with thanks for the thought. Sitting here in the artificial light of Daniel Barenboim's ornate Rococo pastel chateau drawing room, beginning this morning seeing a crimson poinsettia on the pale scrub wooden dining room table upstairs in our house, wondering about the perversity of painters depicting, depicting putty as sensuously fat, naked children who witness lovers, perverted pagan imagery of the god Eros, who is usually depicted as a naked child with a bow and arrow, the original Cupid. I have always thought that love, sex, and romance should not be connected with babies. That is impossible, I suppose. The grief you feel for yourself when after childbirth you have lost your child. Your belly is defaced with red scars, vivid and never and never fading. And ahead of you, 
is not at all the life of romantic living that you thought real life would bring. Prime numbers? No, this is not about prime numbers. It is about all the numbers like 33 that have numbers 3 and 11 as their factors. I feel so lucky to have found you, Robert, standing with you for almost 40 years. My old grievings have been unnecessary. Sea thrift and gorse. I saw myself in watery sunlight, divested of all obligations and connections, walking without luggage along a narrow road by a sandy bay with a sea thrift and gorse and a solitary pine. From Sea Tooth by Ian McEwen. As if the sea is not the most extravagant of all distributors, scattering everything that falls into it. Sea thrift, an oxymoron, not like a pinched Spartan bookkeeper, but growing exuberantly pink and sweet in marshes or rocky gardens. And gorse, yellow ragamuffin gypsy king, taking over wherever it grows. Yes, it's life's dessert to romanticize oneself as sea thrift and gorse. Life's sugar plum, its yellow jelly bean. Names that are wishful, even deceptive. The satin slipper pinkness of sea thrift, the melting butter yellow flower of gorse, cradled in brambles, or the royal cloaking purple cascade of late spring wisteria, all suggest that to name displays our urge not to be honest, but to transform the plain or ugly. A beautiful name, if not a beautiful body. My name, Di my name Diane, declares moon goddess, it too an oxymoron, as I control nothing, not tides or madness, not lovers or night-blooming flowers. My name, like so many names, extravagantly, ironically, belies my organic or celestial natures. I read novels and write I read novels and watch film to become invisible. I suppose because I am not beautiful. Instead, I am grasping, urgent, the way wisteria vines twist around spruce columns, holding up a covered deck, becoming trunk instead of sinew, and gripping terrace wood until it disappears without seeming even to splinter. Call me Diane, I say, wanting you to think of moonlight, not of a vine that crushes. If I were a jelly bean, I'd be the purple one that nobody likes. Mercurial. That afternoon in Brittany, we twisted along and through the carts of oyster mongers, offering briny open shells for our mouths, pale cream moons with their messages of salt, the lemons, the ice. That afternoon when politeness was lost to twisty gushing. Oh, if every day could be always like that. If I could always have that lucent voice, the voice of oysters with which I spoke to my companions that day, the sea nymph voice of a woman wearing tidal foam, not my metallic voice, cold and quick silvering everyone. My polite facade rough walls me against oceans, centuries of female history, 
But that day, I was able to disguise the crankling shards of my honest vocal self to disguise the more masculine voice of tarnished cutlery, commoner in me than the Lady Moon's fluid timbre, which that day was mine. Always I've been flattered that I am named Diane, for the moon goddess, yet always I worried that my real name should be Polite Mercury. He's the trickster, not the not quite god, my twin, the pizza boy to whom I opened the door as he hovered there with wings on his feet, trying to rescue me. Merciless, I sent him away, remembering David, my brother, who died on a cliff over the sea. I could not banish the trickster inside me, murmuring, you are not a woman, Diane. All the men you ever rejected are inside you. You can never be moon goddess. Desperate, I bargain. Please, I am willing even to be twin to the moon goddess. I'll discover some arcane mythology, invent the story of a trickster moon to explain her gentle disappearances. But the messenger voice only repeats politely, You must accept this. You are a fake, Diane. Quicksilver, not sterling. Slippery, not moon, but mercury. The silver that is not silver. Remember, your first given name is Patricia, not Diane. You can't ever, you were never, even on that one day in Brittany, free of deception. You always shed, not the moon's light, but quicksilver beads, poisonous, rolling under chiffoniers, holding the history of all women. You can never be moon. She who ate oysters from the great sea, ivory with translucent desire. Oysters briny with salt, oysters with lemon, oysters winking against shells, pale moons in their craters of ice. El Segundo Blues for Penny Perry. Bill Evans' jazz piano, like those butterflies, a blue wafting mass made up of small fingering delicacies, flutters into my old ears, returns me to smears of beach drift and sea foam. I hold them close, like scraps of lace or broken shells. Child, Diane, I caught small-winged, tiny, gray, black, white, and orange patterned butterflies that lit on my childhood lantana hedge. But though I now realized we lived close to the El Segundo Blues ecosystem, I suspect my butterflies were a different California species, since I never saw any interior blue wings, and the male El Segundos have them. Lonely Diane. What if I had followed the lane past the lantana hedge, all the way down beyond the King's Highway, El Camino Real? Would I have discovered how bound I was? Bound by my mother's manless life? Wondering always about acceptance. If I had followed my butterflies down the lane, down from our house, down beyond the King's Highway, as 101 was first named, would it have led me to an underworld all of men or boys? Perhaps Peter Pan and other lost boys, some male enclave, a balance against the all-female world of my mother, my sister, and me? Would there have been 
the arm of a bayou winding out to open water, to embrace a ship in its curve, an old clipper with masts and rigging, pirates near the land where Disneyland would later be built. It has always been so hard for me to like women. The world of women seemed like prison to me, gray as the wing interiors of the female El Segundo Blue. Mm -hmm. And I might as well say right now that I never liked Tinkerbell. She was a mean girl, and in real life, she would have been a cheerleader. <laughs> if I had wandered in, she would have buzzed me, turning me away. I might have fought her, but just the, I think, wishfully, a cloud of migrating El Segundo blues might have appeared, whirling back up the lane from which I had come. And as always, I would have followed them never finding the lost boys, would have followed the indigo wings, dizzy with frittering blue, their male beauty calling me louder than any lost boy. As they swirled up Russell Lane, back to my familiar neighborhood, heading to my old lantana hedge with its little cushions of variegated lavender and white florets. There, the swarm would have settled, an apron, a patch, a flag of sapphire, reminding me of magic, how it always harbors the unknown. The music of Bill Evans leading me also with his swirl of cascading phrases, his male authority of blue encounter, his hand replacing mine on the keyboard, Grazing in buckwheat, I long to feel surrounded by recognition's fizz, a man's touch that always surprises me, a scrap of blue wing on the white gravel driveway. Beauty's Voice When the night taps on glass and in the dark, I brush past down comforters, puffy as birds, fluffed and huddled away from a storm to see who's there. I find no one but myself, an aging woman, small as a finch. Shivering, I put on a heavy white Irish sweater that I've mended and mended to keep its comfort whole. And though outside I know that the sunflowers are bending almost to the earth with autumn, so that I also need wool socks, soft as gardenias, mm -hmm. on my bare feet before I descend mm -hmm. the stairs. It's not the fatigue of sleep disturbance that I carry with me. It's anticipation like the lightning clusters of gypsy peppers ripening in their late season pots. I feel tight, ready. Tonight, something called me down these stairs to find an old book on my shelves since college. I think if it weren't for Wilbur's title, Love Calls Us to Things of This World, the poem would never have stayed in my mind. At times like this, I think I understand what my education has been all about, ordering the mind so that it is clear enough to hear beauty's voice and perhaps to remember it. Love has always called me. When Creeley says, oh, love, where are you leading me? I trust that he already knows the answer, a rhetorical question with infinite replies. Creeley is warning that poetry, love, takes you to divine and dangerously beautiful places. As Wilbur experienced it briefly in the clean sheets flapping on the clothesline in Italy. As it nudged D.H. Lawrence in Sicily, forcing him belatedly to realize the divine presence of the venomous gold snake. 
as it transformed killing into new birth in Kinnell's Eskimo spirit hibernating in the trophy bearskin as it nudged Jack Gilbert finding the hairs of dead Machiko tangled in the earth of a potted plant. As it touched Gary Snyder bathing communally with his wife and children in their outdoor sauna. Waking to night tapping or the voice inhuman of our old house creaking in the cold sometimes gives me a sense of knowing that like all of them, I have been in the presence of beauty, waking to it, unlike the frequent insomnia that tears me ragged and reveals my emptiness many nights when the details of my life like stained ribbons of old cloth, banal as TV news, or tainted with stupidity. When I know beauty has deserted me, I do not listen for angels to think that I might ever actually hear them. What I hear is the soft turning of pages, the clink of my cup of steaming Assam tea against its huge saucer, the hard edge of my mind drawing a line that extends like a wireless cable into an eternity where I imagine that I have been quiet enough or slept with an empty mind enough that I can visit. Tonight, I've heard the voice of a 50s poem saying, Love calls us to things of this world so clearly in my ear that I could not remain lying there in the inner warmth of my marriage, cuddled, cosseted, a woman whose old angers have died. Sometimes now, a peaceful woman, aging. Instead, the sound on the glass, the swish of linen, my padded body all combine to make me say, I'm ready, I'm ready, even though I should have asked, who is calling? Thank you, Corinne, Tony, Kay, Helen, for such a, an intimate, loving, eloquent, poignant, soothing reading. You know, the one thing that stuck with me, obviously I just heard it, Corinne read, uh, you know, uh, Diane talking about Creeley, and she said, poetry, love takes us, takes you to divine and dangerously beautiful places. Mm -hmm. And that is so true. And she's such a sagacious woman. Uh, we have a few more minutes. Uh, Jennifer has allowed us to go over a, a little bit. So why don't we just start with Corinne and then we'll go to Kay and Helen and Tony and talk a little bit about the poetry or the reading, whichever you would like to talk about. Corinne, what would you like to say? Yeah, well, I enjoyed reading and listening to uh, Diane Mikowski because she's certainly speaking to us in a very contemporary fashion. She, you know, you, 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 she touches our lives and uh, as certainly uh, a women's lives, although it surprised me to hear her say, she really, uh, what did she say in the first poem I read? She really found it difficult to like women. But it seems that she does understand them. Well, I, I enjoyed uh, reading uh, this poem. It's a long poem that I read and uh, was uh, um, taken with the, uh, the, the, the aging process, how she used it with flowers. And uh, I thought that was terrific. It was, it, it touched me very much, but I was surprised that I felt so emotional about it. Uh, what's a surprise? <laughs> <laughs> it's getting old. <laughs> mm -hmm. Helen? Uh, well, I, I um, first of all, I, just loved listening to everybody read because th these kind of poems are, they really touch the, 
so many emotions in you. Um, and I did read uh, about um, uh, Diane that uh, when she her early poems, uh, she didn't edit. They she just tr- trusted her first draft. And then after she started teaching, uh, she came into more editing. She understood editing more. The poems that I was reading seem, I don't really know for sure, but they must have been pretty early because they uh, really feel like a, a stream of conscious thinking. It, and especially mm-hmm. the letter, I re- reading right. a, a letter, that was a pure stream of conscious thinking and just fun to read that letter. I, I am honored to have read that letter. Mm-hmm. Donnie? Uh, well, it was interesting in, in Corinne's poem, one of them, when she said she didn't like women or felt uncomfortable with that with them or whatever, um, I think in one of the poems I read, um, uh, if men are trees and women are flowers, uh, and she didn't like trees, she didn't know anything about them, which represents men, and she grew up with all women. I could see now. I understand what you meant by saying uh, she didn't like the trees; they wouldn't talk to her. Trees wouldn't talk to her. She couldn't get along with trees, but she loved the beautiful flowers. I was, I saw that. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I mean, I, I that that really struck a note with me when Corinne read that. <laughs> that that's why. <laughs> I also liked about how interlocked uh, the interior of her and the exterior, the nature uh, was within her and uh, with us too. And she mm-hmm. just had a, a wonderful reader, a writer. And she's just one of America's best poets. And you all read so beautifully. Jennifer, are you there? And you want to take us home? I am here. And it is always a pleasure. Um, Your performances were wonderful. And Kay, the poem that you read about being invisible, it is... I mean, it really struck me because that's part of the mission for MPTF Studios is to make sure nobody feels invisible just because they're at a certain age. Mm. So um, I I just loved hearing you say it in that way because it, it should be the counterbalance to what you actually feel by the community that we have surrounding. That's my hope. Yeah. Yes, if we weren't here, then we would feel it much more. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, we, yeah, we keep alive here, I feel. And certainly there's poetry. And uh, and uh, doing the research, and I know we all love it, all these, yeah. all my girlfriends here. We, uh, we, we love it. We love getting involved in it. And, and, uh, and, this, and I must say, Diane, my she is prolific, isn't she? I mean, uh, uh, the, the, these are these are just some of her uh, poems. Is, is that unusual? I mean, Harry, isn't she hasn't she written more poetry than most poets? Well, you know, I, I couldn't. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. But I know she's had over sixty books, including essays and pamphlets. One of her famous pamphlets in the late sixties was uh, an essay on. The myth, you know, the way you work personally and mythically, and that was very influential. And then she had a column that she used to wrote in American Poetry Review, which was one of the big mags in the late '60s and early '70s. So she is a very prolific writer, and and uh, God bless her. She certainly enhanced my life, as all of you have. Sometimes I get to the point where I just, not, uh, you know, you, how how do you go on? But poetry always keeps me alive, and I'm grateful once again to say the. What I've said many times, thanks to Jennifer Clymer and the Creative Chaos team for all the great work they do and for Jennifer for inviting me and for me inviting you and you women all help me uh, live in a fuller way than I would without the poetry show. So thank you all and thank you, Jennifer. Thank you so, so much. Thank you, Harry. <laughs>